Yeah, I have a command. How are you? Come out. Where's your camera? Here we go. You're the rose between here. Isn't she something, folks? <laughs> Could you imagine living with Maureen Dow? <laughs> Lying in bed at the end of the long day, hearing her give you her take on the world. She is really something else. Uh, I actually want that introduction read in every appearance I make from now on. I just said I'm going to, I'm going to have that printed. I want to say thank you to Maureen Dow. Let's have another round of applause for Maureen. Oh. <clears throat> I want to say thanks to, of course, Bob Lynch, Nina Oslu, uh, a special thanks to Ovation for all of their support, the staff of Americans for the Arts, the organization's supporters who help make this annual pilgrimage to Washington possible and to all of you, the stalwart missionaries who travel each year to this remote swamp <laughs> in an attempt to persuade the isolated, ignorant, though well-meaning natives <laughs> to, to come out of their marble huts and discover the civilizing powers of the arts. <clears throat> um, uh, today I will attempt to distill my own relationship to the arts <clears throat> over the past half century into these remarks. I would divide that period of over 50 years into three groups. One, I'll call Art is all around me, but I don't know what art is. The second I'll call art is all around me, so maybe I should introduce myself. And the third is called so much art, so little time. As a child, <clears throat> I grew up in a middle class Long Island suburb in the 1960s and 70s. My father was a public school teacher, my mother a housewife with six children. Back then, if you asked what the arts meant to me, I would have just stared at you blankly, struggling to come up with a redeeming answer. My parents were not opera buffs. They played no instruments, nor did they frequent art galleries or poetry readings. They did not venture into New York City to avail themselves of the countless opportunities that exist there for devotees of classical music, painting, photography, dance, architecture, theater, etc. For most kids in my neighborhood, in fact, trips to the Guggenheim or the Met were rare, if ever. In our classrooms, discussions of Monet and Giverny or the raft of the Medusa, the work of Frederick Remington or Michelangelo or Brancusi were infrequent, if at all. Conversations about Warhol or Maplethorpe, never. <clears throat> Yet, art came into my life then in random and unlikely ways, and most of it through television and films. And as I look back on my childhood, art was indeed everywhere. I just didn't know it. Movies and television were the primary source of this exposure, going back to the artistry of Walt Disney and his renowned animators. I look back on all of the children's films I watched again and again during that time, one was the 1934 release, Babes in Toyland, and starring Laurel and Hardy. The art director was Ed Brandenburg, and the visual effects were by Ray Seabright, who rendered sequences in that film that are some of the most vivid and memorable I'd ever seen as a child, before Jaws and Star Wars and computers. As a child, I loved the 1939 version of Gulliver's Travels, which, according to IMDb, lists... 45 animators that worked on that project. This is a beautiful film that I believe holds up even today as a great work in animated films. 
The Wizard of Oz is a favorite of nearly everyone. However, beyond Judy Garland, the rest of the cast and all of the great music, what else do you remember? Would it be sets and costumes? William Horning was one of the art directors on that film. He also designed films such as Quo Vadis, The Tea House of the August Moon, Rain Tree County, Can on the Hot Tin Roof, North by Northwest, and Ben Hur, among others. Another art director on the film was Cedric Gibbons, who also helped design the 1935 version of Mutiny on the Bounty with Clark Gable and Charles Lawton, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mrs. Miniver, Anchors Away, the 1946 version of The Postman Always Rings Twice with John Garfield and Lana Turner, The Asphalt Jungle, An American in Paris, and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, to name but a few of his lengthy credits. Gibbons attended the Art Students League in New York, graduating in 1915. He went on to win 11 Academy Awards and was nominated 28 times. Gibbons and Seawright are the ones who gave us the yellow brick road, or at least the one you can see on film. Judy Garland, while she skipped down that road, wore costumes designed by Adrian Greenberg, who designed under the name Adrian. Adrian is considered among the most successful costume designers in movie history who actually never won an Academy Award. Through motion pictures, dance also came into my life early as well. I was a child in Massapequa in 1968. We didn't dance around the neighborhood with a combination of simmering violence and balletic grace. <laughs> but when I saw West Side Story, I wanted to dance like them in a gang. <laughs> I wanted to gang dance. I wanted to have gang fights, but with dancing. <laughs> I watched Russ Tamblin flying around that playground, tough, smirking, agile. I snapped my fingers all the time. <laughs> Under my breath, I hummed. Da -na 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 -na. Da -na 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 -na. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> my mother glared at me. Worried that another rumble was about to break out between, between the ethnic factions living under her roof. <clears throat> the great Jerome Robbins choreographed the dance sequences in that film, and Jerome Robbins might as well have come to Massapequa and walked into my living room and pulled me off my couch because for a very long time I wanted to be a shark or a jet. It didn't really matter. I wanted to dance. It looks so fun, so freeing. The classical music repertoire also hovered around my childhood and in, in unusual places. In the 1960s, the closing credits, I mean, I hope some people in this room remember this. In the 1960s, the closing credits of the Huntley Brinkley News Program, the great-grandfather to Brian Williams at the NBC News Anchor Desk, featured Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the second movement, a version that was recorded by Arturo Toscanini with the NBC Symphony Orchestra in 1952. I had no idea that NBC had an orchestra, no doubt, a holdover from NBC's radio heyday. And who was this Toscanini guy? Yet there in Studio 8H, the current home of Saturday Night Live, a television network housed a symphony orchestra, a great symphony orchestra. Can you imagine such a thing today? Another piece of music from my earliest childhood st stayed with me for decades. It was a tune I literally could not get out of my head. A couple of years ago, I found myself working as the radio announcer of the New York Philharmonic's weekly broadcast. In my first season with the Phil, as I stood backstage after, an appoint after a performance next to Maestro Alan Gilbert, I recalled that tune. And I asked Alan, if I hummed a piece of classical music, would you be able to tell me what it is? <laughs> I am having trouble remembering the name. Alan said that he probably could. I hummed the tune for Alan. Here is a recording of that tune 
which I performed for Alan. <clears throat> when I finished my virtuosic, impassioned humming, I turned to a patient, Alan, who may have wondered if this was the beginning of some type of game he would now have to endure. And he said, I, I don't know. <laughs> About a month later, as I surfed YouTube for a clip from an old TV show, I came upon an unrelated item and paused, my memory now jarred. I hit that clip, and there was the tune that we just played, the theme to Captain Kangaroo. The Isle of Wight that the composer knew was also used in BBC children's programming in the 1950s. The Broadway theater was one cultural opportunity that I was occasionally able to access and enjoy growing up, as cost was always a factor. The first Broadway show I, sh I saw was Shenandoah with John Cullum. And although it would be a few more years before I summoned the courage to make that effort myself, Cullum made an indelible impression on me, as did Brian Bedford in Death Trap and the Broadway production of The Wiz. Like any child, as I grew, my horizons broadened, but clearly skewed toward realism in cinema. I was slowly exposed to the editing of George Tomasini in Hitchcock's Psycho, the award-winning cinematography of Jeffrey Unsworth, who shot 2001, A Space Odyssey. Gordon Willis, who photographed such diverse films as The Godfather and Clute, and John Alonzo, who shot Chinatown. I bought a paperback edition of William Goldman's great screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid after I had seen the movie three or four times in the theater. I was fascinated, even at that age, to see this example of the blueprints from which films are made. And then there was acting, always the acting sitting in the dark, hour after hour, transfixed by the incessant, impassioned waves that came over me from James Stewart, Cagney, Bogart, Betty Davis, Gable, Barbara Stanwyck, John Garfield, Mitchum, Kirk Douglas, Richard Burton, Brando, Elizabeth Taylor, Jane Fonda, Pacino. I'm skipping over a bit, <coughs> but now comes the second part. I came here to Washington in 1976 to attend George Washington University. I still had no money, but I'm living in a city. D.C. wasn't a great city back then, but it was on its way to becoming one. Back then, during my freshman year, protesters were burning the Shah of Iran in effigy in Lafayette Park. Today, you might get shot if you even lit a match in Lafayette Park. <laughs> so it was a different era. It was here in Washington that I discovered architecture, having bypassed living in Manhattan en route to college. Now, not to pick on my hometown, but Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and Richard Neutra were not designing many of the buildings going up in Massapequa during my childhood. <laughs> so it was in Washington that I became familiar with L'Enfant, who arrived here in 1791 to build the federal capital city. Washington, to an unsophisticated 18-year-old, was beautiful and inspiring beyond my imagination. I played touch football many weekends right in view of the Lincoln Memorial designed by Henry Bacon, who also designed the DuPont Circle Fountain. Nearly every day that I lived here, I walked past the White House, designed around 1792 by James Hoban and expanded by Benjamin Latrobe in 1801. I thought about all of the men and women who worked there, struggled there, tried and failed there. Ambition had driven many men and a few women to want to reside there. At that time, from 1976 to 1979, I was one of those people. I wanted to be the President of the United States. Then again, so did three of my 
five suite mates at the dorm on 19th and F. <laughs> However, sitting on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on many nights then, the idea seemed <clears throat> so real, so right. Nothing makes you love your country as much as the architecture of Washington, D.C. Back then, <clears throat> Back then, I took the train from Union Station here to Penn Station in New York, a one-way ticket. On the last train out at around 9 p.m. was 19 bucks. I couldn't afford to fly. Daniel Burnham designed Union Station. Burnham had many famous commissions during his career, most notably in Chicago. Along with Frederick Dinkelberg, Burnham also designed the Flatiron Building in New York. It occurred to me, as I traveled to the presumably more sophisticated New York, that Union Station was a monument and Penn Station was a dump. <laughs> Thus, it was around that time that I did some research and learned that the original Penn Station, the legendary McKim, Mead, and White design circa 1910, had been destroyed in 1963 in order to build the current monstrosity. That act, which drew outrage from around the world, led to the creation of the Landmarks Preservation Commission in New York in 1965. Everywhere in Washington were handsome, if not stunning, buildings you believed might never come down. Meanwhile, New Yorkers are reminded of Fran Lebowitz's comment about New York as a place where, quote, they tear down a building and always put up an uglier building. While a student in Washington, I took advantage, though never quite enough, of student discounts for the many museums and other cultural institutions that are here, yet I must admit that seeing films was still my primary preoccupation. While at GW, I discovered art films, and the world opened up another notch again. I got a job in GW student government, part of which was selecting and screening films for students. But more often than not, I could be found at the Circle Theater on 21st in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you remember the question? <clears throat> the Pettis brothers had opened that theater in 1957 as part of a chain of screens they owned that grew to 70. The first film I saw there was Last Tango in Paris. I learned a lot from that film. And not just about sex. I learned about film acting. Oddly enough, I was introduced to Francis Bacon watching the title sequence of that film, just as Lolita, the film, introduced me to Nabokov. And Paths of Glory introduced me to the specific brutality of World War I and to the folly and insanity of military justice. Films instantly became a prism through which one could reimagine their view of the world. The circle was torn down in 1986 and became a parking lot, and I think it's now an office building. Did you hear that, Fran Leibowitz? At GW, I took my first acting class, acting for non-drama majors. <laughs> I was terrible. I was terrible, but I suppose I was less terrible than everybody else. So I transferred to NYU, studied acting at Tisch, and became an actor, which I still, to this day, consider bizarre. Now, with a few exceptions, I'm going to skip over most of this part, although it is reasonable to assume that during the past 30 years, I have met and or worked with some of the most talented and well-regarded designers, cinematographers, editors, costumers, directors, writers, and actors in the business. But I want to tell you about what I'm doing in the arts now, right now and how art is more important in my life than ever. While performing on a soap opera in New York, my first job ever was on that show. We taped a scene, my death scene, actually. It was the end of my contract. And I was being killed off the show. This is a true story. Two people shot me simultaneously who were unaware of each other's presence. Through a window and through a doorway, two people who were unaware shot me simultaneously. Now, that's very soap opera-ish, but very interesting when you think about it. I think it is. 
My character was a very immoral young man. He deserved to be shot twice. <laughs> for two completely different motivations. During the scene, certain evocative music played. I turned to our casting director, who happened to be on the set that day, the wonderful Roger Sturdivant. Sturdivant was one of those New Yorkers I met early on who just pulsed artistic sophistication. What is that music, I asked Roger. Roger looked at me askance with a cigarette in his hand. People smoked on TV studios back then. Roger looked at me askance and said, It's the Symphony Fantastique, the march to the scaffold. <laughs> Parenthetically, doesn't everyone know that? <laughs> Roger meant well, but I was chastised. I left work that day a changed man. Whatever latent learning may have occurred in my high school music class, when Mr. Stoll, my music teacher, attempted to elevate our musical taste with Minotti operas like the, the telephone and the medium, that latent learning suddenly kicked in. Roger's tone matched Fred Stoll's tone. This music is something you should acquaint yourself with, if not now, then one day, and hopefully soon. Because the sooner you begin to appreciate this music, the better your life will be. In the ensuing years, I moved to Los Angeles in order to find work. Driving in my car hour after hour in the mid-80s, the radio was on nearly all the time. Music that had once seduced me now abandoned me. I was awash in tunes and lyrics that were geared more toward either 15-year-old girls or adults with some sort of unidentified brain disorder. <laughs> I turned on a classical station and I was home. Before the advent of the internet and cell phones uh, were primarily car phones, I would pause outside the gates of Warner Brothers or Paramount and write down the time that a particular piece was playing. Eventually, I would have the number of each classical station's program director on speed dial on my phone. I'd call and ask what piece it played, what orchestra, what conductor, what label. Before archive music and ordering online, I would head down to Tower Classical on Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. Yes, yes, yes. And I would order my selections, and if they weren't already in stock, they'd mail them to me. Thus, my classical music education began not in a classroom, but in a Chevy Tahoe. <laughs> Driving on the Ventura Freeway in 1985 on my way to work in the gilded coal mines of the entertainment industry. <laughs> I found what I liked. George Schulte in the Chicago, Andre Previn in the LSO, Zell in the Cleveland, Charles Dutrois in the Montreal, Leonard Slatkin in the St. Louis, Stokowski, Muti, Mata, Meta, Barenboim, Boulez, Bernstein. I never went back to popular music. Occasionally, I only visit my old friends, usually. However, I hear new music today and I think, well, I hope that goes well for them. <laughs> and I switch back to what I love. This appreciation has led me to realize that this is something I could have, could have, under different circumstances, dedicated all of my life to, and I would have been very happy. But I did not have that opportunity. Where I grew up, how I grew up, these kinds of choices were not really available to us. Those people who had both the money and the inclination could influence their children in that direction, but for me, no. And when I say that I could have spent my life working in the world of classical music, I do not necessarily mean as a musician or conductor. However, I do tell Dutrois when I see him that if I could be someone else for a month, it would be Charles. <clears throat> Arts administration as many of you know, is an essential aspect of any creative experience. And a career in that field is worthwhile indeed. I have become good friends with Zarin Mehta and his wife Carmen Mehta. Zarin is the outgoing executive director of the New York Philharmonic, having served there for 12 seasons. And he is one of the reasons I was offered the position as the radio announcer for the Phil, which is, without question, the greatest creative pleasure I have ever had. 
watching Zarin and the rest of the staff of the New York Philharmonic steer this great ship through a season of classical repertoire humbles me. There are people in my business who earn a lot of money, and I understand that usually that is because the product is popular, but each performance of the Phil brings to its audience the greatest in artistic achievement in our society today. Raising the funds and producing those programs are both as important as each note that is played. This <clears throat> is apples and oranges, no doubt, but as someone who was attempted to be an artist during my lifetime and often fell short due to the commercial imperatives both in my business and in my own nature, I admire those administrators <clears throat> who have dedicated themselves to bringing the ballet, the symphony, or any art you might name to its audience. Now, I suppose it was out of a combination of deeply felt appreciation for the arts and for the artists, as well as a sense of shame over certain of my own creative choices, <laughs> that I formed a partnership with the Capital One Banking Company to do commercials for them and donate. <laughs> and donate. <laughs> <clears throat> We're going to have some fun with this. Hold on. <clears throat> to form a partnership with the Capital One Banking Company and to do commercials for them and donate all of my fee to charities, nearly all of those arts related. I recently renewed. <laughs> no, 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 uh, oh, thank you. I recently renewed uh, my agreement with Capital One, and although appearing on television as a spokesperson for a bank at the height of the recent recession. as well as the uh, eruption of the Occupy Wall Street movement, had not been a goal of mine. <laughs> I am proud of the work I have been able to support through my association with them. Capital One has been a thoughtful and constructive partner with me in promoting this work and raising awareness for the arts. I mention this because I wish I had a few billion. I wish I had a few billion. I'd be giving most of that away right now. In my attempt to raise awareness about the arts, to cultivate new generations of both trained performers, performers as well as arts administrators, I have sought to convince others on the boards I sit on, as well as within the general arts benefactor community, that funding for the arts is incontrovertibly one of the most important investments our society can make. I think to myself, how can I help to give as many people as possible the chance that came into my life somewhat late? The opportunity to embrace a unique and disciplined life, pursuing art as a dedicated passion, if not a career. I want more people, especially young people, to have a chance at a life of artistic appreciation, self-expression, and freedom. Freedom from the commercial considerations that so often compromise and eventually suffocate real art. I believe this is something many of us wish we had nurtured in ourselves, especially those of us who are looking back on more years than there are ahead. That brings me to our real purpose here tonight. I first came to Washington to advocate on behalf of federal funding for the arts several years ago. No, it was not during the Teddy Roosevelt administration. <laughs> and yes, Bob Lynch was my host then. I believe we have a photo. Can we see that photo, please? Here we are. Here we are. Wow. Let that, let that be a warning of what lobbying in Washington can do to you. <clears throat> Look what it's done to me, how ravaged I am. <clears throat> Actually, it was in 1990 when I was introduced to Americans for the Arts. I learned about the vast network of arts advocacy groups across the country represented by many of you here today. I learned about how much of the fiscal and political paradigm of government support for the arts. I learned about the relative successes, two more recent examples of which are, in 2011, the NEA funded the Blue Star Museums Project, offering free admission to all active duty military personnel and their families to 1,000 museums from Memorial Day to Labor Day in 2011. 
And currently, the NEA funds the highly successful program Poetry Out Loud, a national poetry recitation contest in all 50 states with over 365,000 students competing last year, 2010 to 2011. The 2012 national finals will be here in Washington next month. Although controversial grants involving artists like Karen Finley and Robert Maplethorpe and Andres Serrano are a thing of the past due to the elimination of individual grants, something that I think is a mistake, some detractors... <clears throat> Some detractors still find areas they view as objectionable in more current appropriations. One example that was offered to me that we unearthed today was this. In 2009, in the U.S. Economic Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Congress voted to give $50 million to the NEA, $50 million to make grants to, the, to arts organizations for the purpose of job creation and preservation. It was a great success, helping to create or save over 5,000 jobs in every part of the United States. A self-described, quote, conservative syndicated columnist and Fox News Channel contributor named... Then I have a note here that says, don't really need to give her name recognition, FYI. That came from Bob Lipsch, by the way. <laughs> Don't really want to give her name recognition, FYI. Conservative syndicated columnist and Fox News Channel contributor, who will remain nameless, came out on Fox News with a list of controversial grants from this program. Her list focused on grants to groups such as a Center for Puppetry, an International Accordion Festival, the Maine, the Maine Indian Basket Maker Alliance, the California Lawyers for the Arts, all attacked without reference to quality, as if simply words like puppetry or basket maker or accordion or lawyer were enough to be ridiculed. <laughs> it seemed like the rest of her list focused on any organization or project that had the words nude, gay, lesbian, ritual, or California in them. I am announcing today the formation of a contest. <laughs> My own personal foundation will be awarding a prize of $5,000 to the person who submits the winning poem. It's a poetry contest. A poem which uses the words basket maker, accordion, lawyer, nude, gay, lesbian, ritual, in California. Early on in this process, I began to grasp what the realities of the business of the arts are in America. I won't rehash for you, the faithful, what all those talking points and statistics are, yet they remain solid, unwavering evidence as to the efficacy of this spending. Indulge me as I name three that I think are worth intoning here this afternoon. The arts create economic activity and produce tax revenue. The nonprofit arts industry generates $166.2 billion annually in economic activity, supports 5.7 million full-time equivalent jobs in the arts and related industries, and returns $12.6 billion in federal income tax fees, measured against direct federal cultural spending of about $1.8 billion. That's a return of nearly 9 to 1. That's a st statistic from... Americans for the Arts in 2007. Number two, the arts are a magnet for local business. I love this one. A strong arts sector is an economic asset that stimulates business activity, attracting companies that want to offer their employees and clients a creative climate and an attractive community with high amenity value. The arts have been shown to be a successful and sustainable strategy for revitalizing rural areas, inner cities, and populations struggling with poverty. Arts organizations purchase goods and services that help local merchants thrive. Arts audiences also spend more than $100 billion, $100 billion on admissions, transportation, food, lodging, and souvenirs that boost local economies, again from the 2007 Americans for the Arts report. <clears throat> I have a 16-year-old daughter, so I'm really, really holding my breath on this one. Art students outperform non-art students on the SAT. 
Data from the federal government shows that students who take four years of arts and music classes while in high school, on average, score about 100 points better on their SATs than students who only take one half year or less. This one from the College Board of 2011, a report on college-bound seniors. Generates tax revenues, helps the local economy, creates advantages for our children's academic futures, and those are just three that I've mentioned. Yet every year that I have come down here, it's still a battle. There are more things in the budget of our government that are less deserving of federal funding than anything you will ever find in an NEA appropriation. And many of those are rarely, if ever, threatened. However, here you are again. And I am proud to join you in support of your great work rallying the troops, asserting the facts, making our case. The NEA received $175 million in 1992. 20 years later, that figure adjusted for inflation would be $268,500,000. This year, they got $146 million. <clears throat> if I were president, <laughs> it's kind of an insane idea when you think about it. Um, if I were president, I would lobby for a billion dollars to the NEA and the NEH each. Yeah. Yeah. And I would still consider that not enough. However, I've been asked to mention by Bob and Americans for the Arts that they would be happy with an appropriation of just a dollar per U.S. citizen. Bob would be happy with that. Give me 320 million, he says, and Bob would like that. I would also reconstitute the board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in order to push public broadcasting closer to its original intended mandate to serve that area of the American public not addressed by the commercial broadcast and cable spectrums. <clears throat> Especially now in an age where Americans need increasingly more, not less, unfettered information about the issues that influence, if not outright threaten us at home and abroad. But if the past many years are an indicator, we should prepare to come back here again and again and again, all the while educating and training new generations of not merely patrons of the arts, but stewards of our own cultural heritage, as well as those of the cultures that preceded ours. How many of you here today, let me just have some applause from how many of you here today are here in Washington to advocate on behalf of an arts group in this country who are under 40 years old? That's the future of this movement right there. I'm going to stop now, but I want you to know that I was in Dallas recently at the Performing Arts Center there they told me they're going to close up a big piece of the freeway there in Dallas, tear it up, build a park, and unify an area of arts-related facilities into their very own Lincoln Center. I was thrilled to learn that. Dallas, Texas. Yeah. I also wanted to tell you that I'm scheduled to do a show on Broadway next spring, and as always... Well, as always, the chance to work on a great play with a smart group of people in the theater is as good as it gets creatively in my business. At the same time, I am overwhelmingly grateful for the past several years of doing 30 Rock on NBC. The show is clever. The cast and crew are remarkably dedicated and talented. We consider ourselves lucky to have such wonderful jobs. <clears throat> and yet, on an entirely selfish level, I want to show you one of the reasons why I'm lucky. Can we see that slide, please? This is a painting entitled Sea and Mirrors that was painted by the, the artist Ross Blechner in 1996. I was sent an invitation to an exhibit of Ross's many years ago at the Mary Boone Gallery in New York. The printed material featured a depiction of this painting. Last year, I went to another show of Ross's at Mary's Gallery, and I told Mary that I had carried this image on that invitation with me in my daily paperwork for many years because I was so taken with it. Mary paused and said, 
I know who owns that, and I think there's a chance that it's for sale. I carry this thing in my shoulder bag for probably six or seven years. I love this thing so much. Three months later, it was hanging in my house, in my apartment in New York. And even, but I want you to know that even carrying the photograph of this in my bag for seven years was strangely fulfilling to me. <clears throat> but I want to admit that owning it is a lot better. <laughs> but carrying that, carry, <laughs> carrying that card in my bag, I had two of them actually. One was a photographer from East Hampton. I bought that one too. Um, <clears throat> No, but I, carrying this in my, in my bag all those years, I, it, 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 it was so fulfilling to me personally. I just loved this art. I, thought, I looked at this thing, I thought, I'm never going to own this painting. But I love it. I just want to have this. I want to see it. I want to look at it, even if I can't look at it on a wall. Because you see, in spite of what I do for a living, in spite of how much rich creativity is potentially around me every day in my field, I get my art the way you get your art as a ticket holder, as an audience member, as a patron. And although I may eventually get on a shorter line than many other people, my love of the arts and for artists is no different than yours. And I want as many people as possible to experience that regardless of income, where you live, or whether or not your elected representatives get it as far as the arts movement is concerned. <laughs> <clears throat> I truly love Ross's paintings. Perhaps that's the new phase I'm in now. Art. Sometimes you've just got to buy it. <laughs> but remember that the path from Ross's painting began with Disney animation, the theme to Captain Kangaroo, Fred Stoll in the seventh grade, Russ Tamblin. My brothers and I, gang fight dancing. <laughs> Brando in the dark theater and sitting, waiting for a train in Union Station. Artistic appreciation believes that art is like water. It's essential. And I am honored to be here with all of you to carry the water on behalf of the arts again in 2012. Thank you and good night.